Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And then a new command that Jesus gave us was to love one another, even as Jesus loved us, and that this would mark a disciple and uh, we would be known by our love for one another. And so being that we have to love like Jesus, we've been looking at different attributes that we should acquire. And um, so we have looked at acquiring Jesus' attitude uh, in Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We've been looking at acquiring Jesus' love. We've looked at acquiring Jesus' goodness. Last week, we looked at acquiring Jesus' forgiveness and the, the ability to forgive people and that determining how we're forgiven. If we want mercy, we should show it. Today, we're in Luke chapter 5, and uh, we are looking at acquiring Jesus' work. What do you do for a living? What, where do you find, uh, where you find meaning and identity? Remember, when God created us, us God gave us two things to Adam. He first thing he gave Adam was personality. He identified himself as a person named Adam. But the second thing that he gave Adam was work. <laughs> Wife came later, Ken. And uh, <laughs> the second thing that he gave him was work, something to do. And how do we you identify? That's usually how you identify yourself, right? You identify yourself as I'm Reagan and I'm a pastor. And you do the same thing. And if you're retired, you still identify yourself as being retired from what you used to do. And so what I want us to look at, what did Jesus do? Not to be cliche -ish. And uh, how did that affect, affect his life? And how should that affect ours? Or in Luke chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 1. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word... He was standing by Lake Gennesaret, or Lake Galilee. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. So when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they took. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. Do not be afraid, Jesus replied. From now on, you'll be catching people. And they brought the boats to land left everything, and followed him. Acquiring Jesus' work. What did Jesus do that ended up with you and me sitting here in the building today, setting aside our time, setting aside our lives, maybe sitting in Facebook or sitting on the parking lot listening? What causes just Jesus to be who he is in such a way that all these people follow him? And not just during his day and age, but 2,000 years later. What is it about him that causes that? And how does that relate to us? And how does it affect us? How should we model that in our own lives? Let's look at it. Jesus pursued people with a purpose. I don't know how you feel about people. My goal in life was to get an engineering degree, go work for NASA, hide in a room, and look at stars. Okay, if that gives you any idea about my attitude towards people, there it was. And so, and here I stand before, yeah, <laughs> and, and here I stand in front of people, preaching to people, which was not my desire, but it was God's call. How do you move a person from that mentality to leading and, and ministering and doing those things? Jesus has been doing this a long time before he actually became on earth. So, 
Jesus pursued people with a purpose. He preached God's word to the people. What do we find him in this passage? He wasn't there pursuing Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. He wasn't doing that. He was by the lake. And he had all these people following, not the men. Where were they? They've been out fishing all night. That was their living. They just happened to be on the shore cleaning their nets. Okay? Jesus was pursuing this people. And what is interesting to me, that's why I smiled when I read it, Jesus invites himself into people's lives. Have you ever noticed that? And if, you ever, if you've ever been around people that follow Jesus and are like that, they do the same thing. They don't ask you if you want to talk. They just start the conversation. They don't ask you. They invite themselves in. Notice what Jesus does. He sees the boats there and he goes and stands in it. <laughs> You know, imagine whatever job you do and you just, this guy walks up, if, you know, fireman or whatever you do, he just walks in your truck and sits down. I need a ride. Now, how would you feel about that? Jesus just kind of ushered himself into the lives of these fishermen, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> Okay, and so he steps in the boat and then he says, hey, will you push off the shore a little bit so I can speak? And so they were like, uh, sure. And so they get in the boat and they push off and Jesus sits down and teaches the people. Jesus, so many times we wait on people to take the initiative. We wait until something in their lives draws them to us. We're so shy, aren't we? Even though we may not, we could talk to a fence post, but when it comes to trying to have an impact or an influence on someone's lives, we just clam up. We get so shy. We're so nervous. Well, well you know, and we'll get to the, the, all of our fears in a minute as we move through the text. There's no fear in Jesus. In fact, what he does is he created the opportunity to speak to these four men by getting in their boat. He created the opportunity to have this crowd by beginning to speak. By doing his, this is what he, this wasn't an odd day for Jesus. Okay? This is a daily thing for him. He constantly went around creating opportunities where he could bring God's word to as many people as possible. Do we do that? Do we create opportunities, invite people to our homes and open so many, whatever you're gifting or whatever you are comfortable doing, do you create opportunities for people to hear? But he didn't stop there. So a lot of times, you know, that's just a, a casual meeting if the gospel or if God is not introduced into it. So Jesus always had a purpose and a reason and he challenged people's faith. This is the second thing he did. So when he finished speaking, he had got done doing his little message. And then uh, he turns and he looks at Peter. He says, hey, put out in the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Uh, and Peter responded, um, you know, I don't know what your occupation was in the past, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't a fisherman. Right? We've been out all night. The fish ain't biting. Not good English, but they're not biting. You know, you're a preacher. That doesn't give you much qualification there. Especially if you've been fishing with me, I can't catch nothing. Anyway, and he's a carpenter before that, right? He could have thrown all that out. Jesus is challenging him to something. Have you ever been challenged by somebody? Especially someone that don't know what they're talking about. You've been doing this for years and years and then some young whippersnapper comes up to you and acts like they know what they're talking about and they ain't got a clue what they're saying, right? It'd be like me trying to talk about cars. I ain't got a clue. I know how to put the gas in and turn the key. That's about it. Okay? And so, so here's Jesus. He's sitting there, just gets through preaching. He says, hey guys, put out and throw, go to a deep area and wherever you want to go, put your nets down. Jesus challenged people's faith. He instructs them to do something and I don't know how you would feel. Probably caught them a little off guard. They'd already been out. Here was a question. 
Did they trust their own instincts and their own ideas about what they were going to do or they were just going to simply take this guy at his word and go out and do it? Had nothing to do with catching fish. It had to do with what they had just heard from the sermon and now did they really trust this guy? You know, when we talk about sharing with people and, and, and sharing our faith with people, we talk about what we don't know. We talk about being intimidated or I might be a bad influence. I may mess it all up. It really has nothing to do with that. It really has more to do with what God has already said to us and what we really believe about it. Do we really trust God to be able to work in my life? And this had nothing to do with actually presenting the gospel or anything. This had to do with fishing. And Jesus was challenging their faith. You know, you may not have much faith in the fishing right now, but do you trust me enough to go out into the water a little bit, throw down your nets? You know, and you may not know about the, much about the word. You may not think that you're a very good person or you're good enough to be a, a, a representative for God in people's lives. But it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with you at all, does it? It's do you trust God enough that he's big enough that he can work through whatever you have regardless of how useless you may think it is or how hopeless it may seem to be. There's not any fish out there, Lord, but because you said it, we'll go. <laughs> and we'll just have to clean the nets Again. So they went. Okay? But then we see God's word revealed. Now Jesus had been preaching this whole time. Did you see anything result from it? Well, you know, we don't know of anybody coming to, you know, if they find it doesn't reveal much to us there. But we do get to find out about the fish. Okay? And so ob obedience brings results. Their nets, begin, they, go, they throw it down there and they start pulling and there's something in it. That's the first time that's happened in about 10 hours. They had not caught nothing, remember? And then all of a sudden they start pulling. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Hey, come here. We need help. All right. Their boats begin to sink. Both boats from the amount of fish that they had. I don't know if you've ever caught that much, many fish before. If you had to go coasting in a little bit, if you ever watch Swamp People, you, they got one where they caught so many gators that the, the, there's a half an inch between the water and the edge of their boat. That would probably be a little scary. And so you can imagine how they felt because, you know, their power was <laughs> their arms. They didn't have a motor. Whoo! And the, a reminder, they were in deep water. Can you imagine being in that circumstance? And not just the, the concept of, man, that's a lot of fish. It only happened because Jesus told them that it would. So here you've heard this guy talking the whole time. Oh, that's nice. It's a good little sermon. And then he says, hey, well, let's get out of the, the spiritual world. Let's talk about your world because you think the two are separate and they're not. Put out and drop your nets. See, the reality is, is God is not just God in here. God's God out there. Okay? He's God in the church house. He's God in the ice house. He's God on the lake. He's God in the ocean. He's God in your yard. He's God at Walmart, believe it or not. Okay? He's got anywhere that he can go. And he has authority over every single thing that's there, including men. But he just wanted to demonstrate his power. You can't always see it in men, but you can see it in fish. And so he proved his authority to them in that. So Jesus, God's words are real not only in Jesus, but also in Peter. So here's the thing. This is what really makes us uncomfortable about encountering God and being a witness for God. It's because it's not about what? It's not so much that we trust God or don't trust God. See, there's that other part because when God gets involved, you know, it's kind of like, 
you know, and when you wake up in the morning and the lights aren't on, you look good. But when the light comes on, oh, oh, we need to fix that a little bit. Right? And so, you know, my life is okay and I'm okay. But once I start talking about God and get the Bible involved, start witnessing, oh, I have to quit doing this and I need to start doing that and need to quit going there and need to start going here. See, it puts discipline in our life and we start having to do what's right. See, sometimes we prefer not to do that. So we just keep quiet. But Jesus challenged people's faith. And so when he, all of this happens, it's interesting what Peter does. When he sees the fish and he heard the word, what did he do? He told Jesus to leave. Read it. When, verse 8, when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man. Get out of here. Go. Hmm. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't listen to him? It's our nature to resist God. It's our nature to resist the things of God. Even when we believe in God, even when we trust God, even when we come to faith, you know, and I have a desire to follow God, but I don't know if you have this problem, but there's still Reagan <laughs> that I have to deal with. And see, Reagan doesn't always, Reagan likes to do what Reagan likes to do. Reagan likes to go where Reagan wants to go. He likes to kind of call the shots. Well, I don't want to do that today. Well, let's not do it. I don't want to talk to that person. Well, okay, well, let's not do it. That's a great idea. But Reagan gets Reagan in a lot of trouble. Reagan needs help. Reagan needs the Lord. I'm a terrible steward. I'm a worse Lord. And so Jesus comes in to help us. And he says, hey, get out of here. Why does he say that? Because he recognizes he doesn't have any clue about, he knows about fishing. But he don't know anything about God. And he don't know anything about the way that Jesus lives. And so it would just be better for both of them if he would just leave, me, leave him alone. <laughs> Why? Because through that prophecy, Jesus revealed something about himself. I'm a little bit more than just a fella that was speaking on the beach and asked to get in your boat. And Peter didn't feel worthy. But see, here's the catch. Peter wasn't worthy of Jesus to enter his boat when he stepped in it in the first place. The reality is, is why does God have to invite himself in? Because we'll never invite him. We look at people and think, man, they need to get their lives straight. <laughs> and I laugh to myself. They're never going to get their lives straight. Not on their own. Peter would have never gotten his life straight if he hadn't met Jesus that day. Amen. And you would have never gotten your life straight if you hadn't met Jesus. But you wouldn't have met Jesus if someone hadn't introduced you to him. Amen. And so sometimes you just have to invite yourself in the boat. Sometimes you just have to be a little pushy. Well, Brother Ray, I don't know about that. Well, let me give you an example. I have always been self-absorbed and into myself. And it was at a peak when I was a teenager. I know that is very shocking. But there was an individual in my life who did not care about my independence. Her name was Ellen Reeves. For those of you who do not know who she is, she is my mother. And out of great love and compassion, she put up with me. Why? Because she loved me. 
Make sense? And she put up with a lot of mess because she cared. And sometimes she invited herself into my room. She was not welcome in my room. But she didn't care because she had the authority to be there. And God is the same way. He had the authority to be in that boat whether he was invited to or not. And he was, before Peter recognized he was a sinner, he was unworthy. But at least at this point, he realized it. Jesus challenges people's faith, faith to introduce them to God and to himself. Challenge results in a confrontation of us choosing our own lives and our own will or choosing a new life with God. So we can either continue in our lives without him, which is normal, or we can begin a new life with him. And so what was Jesus' work ultimately? The last point, Jesus changed and commissioned people. So he pursued people with the purpose. He challenged their faith with his words. But he didn't stop there. He didn't just give them the word of God and say, well, good luck. No, he went one step further. He invested into their lives and he, he changed their lives and then he commissioned them to do what he was doing. Look what he says. Hey, hey. Yeah, this kind of freaked you out, but don't be afraid. If I wanted to get you, I'd already got you. I'd have thrown in a couple more fish and the boats would have sank. You'd all have drowned, but I'd have walked off, up, walked off on the water. <laughs> See, God could have got them if he wanted to get them. We think, oh, God's just not, God is not bad. He was sitting in there with the boat with them. Blessed them with all that fish and think, man, we've been so blessed. No, the fish weren't the blessing. And see, Peter didn't say, oh, God, thank you for this big old boatload of fish. No, he recognized he was in the presence of God. And that was a lot better. And the most amazing thing happens. It says, look, number one, don't be afraid. Peter was afraid in God's presence. Sometimes you may be afraid in God's presence. Yeah, and rightly so. You need to have a healthy fear of God. You need to have a healthy fear of the authorities that are above you, regardless of what those authorities may be, whether it's a parent whether it's police, whether it's an official, you need to have a healthy fear and respect for those people, if not because of the people, for the position that they uphold. Amen? Okay? And so he had a fear and a respect. But there's a beautiful passage in Scripture in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Beautiful text. It's that Mark is actually Peter's gospel. John Mark hung out with Peter, and so he wrote down basically what Peter would preach. And a beautiful little text in Mark chapter 3, verse 13, it says this. Then Jesus went up the mountain, and he summoned those he wanted. Not that he needed, that he wanted. So here's a crazy thing. You ever been around people? Just general people. They're not always pleasant. Especially when they've been all, uh, out all night, caught nothing, and cleaning their nets. He'd been around them all day. He probably heard them talking, all the little things they were saying. You can imagine what sailors talk about. And yet Jesus invited them in the boat. Then he invited them to keep his company. He didn't need them. He wanted them. Do we want people like that? Do you see people living the way they live and you think, man, I would love to have that person come to my church. I would love to have that person come eat at my house. Jesus.
Jesus wanted Peter. And Jesus wants us. And not just us in this room, but us. To the ends of the earth. But he didn't stop there. He said, look, don't be afraid. But this ain't nothing. From now on, we'll catch people. Fish ain't nothing. The harder, the more, the harder thing to do, the more fun is catching people. See, this is what's weird. This is what's great about God. See, God's thing is, he loves it. He loves to do this. It's his favorite thing to do. What's your favorite thing to do? Your favorite hobby. Maybe it's to go fishing. Maybe it's a variety of things. What's your hobby? What's the things that you invest? We won't even talk about how much money we invest in hunting and those sorts of things. God's big hobby, his big hunt is people. He loves hunting people. His favorite thing to do is take the, the wickedest, most vile, corrupt person that he can and begin to, to bait them with his love and his kindness and his goodness. He chums the waters with it. Never thought of it like that, have you? He just chums the waters with it and just lets them get big and fat and full. And then he just puts the hook of the gospel in their mouth. He just puts the hook. He loves to do that. He loves to take the most rotten, vile, slimy, nasty sinner and say, hey, you know what? I love you. Hey, you know what? I care about you. You don't care a bit about me. But I care about you. In fact, I love you so much, I died for you. And, uh, and the power of that love is so powerful that I resurrected from the dead. It couldn't keep me back from you. I love you. Peter in there and missed them all those fish. Fish, get out of here. Peter, don't be afraid. If I was going to get you, I'd already got you. Now come on. Let's go catch men. See, God doesn't just change us. He doesn't make, just make you a person. He didn't do that to Adam. He doesn't do that to the new rec recreated creatures that he makes. He gave us something to do. And that work is to go get people. Well, which ones? The most vile, slimy, nasty ones, just like them fish. <laughs> he loves that. It's his favorite thing to do. Take people that shake their fist in his face and make them his children. Oh, I don't know about Well, didn't he do that to you? And were you so pretty and shiny when you came to Jesus? You were just the nicest person in the world. He's like, man, you would just make my kingdom such a great place because you're so great. No. You were just as wicked as the people that we look down upon sometimes. If not worse. <laughs> right? But God demonstrated you his kindness and goodness. And then an amazing thing happens. He transforms you and says, Now, I'm going to show you how to do this. You do the same thing. Well, I don't know what to do, Brother Reagan. Well, it's real simple. Number one, you pursue people with a purpose. You invite yourself into their lives, even when they don't want it. You challenge their faith by giving them God's word. And when God reveals himself to them, it reveals God to be God and us not, and we don't have any worth towards him. But then we discover an amazing thing, that he wants us anyway. And he changes us from the inside out and then asks us to go tell others the same privilege of knowing him that you have. Have you come to know Jesus? Have you come to that point like Peter where you recognize 
there's a big difference between you and me. And I'm a sinner and you're perfect. And I don't deserve you. That's that admission of guilt. But then there's a belief and a trust that we have. I believe and trust in what you did for me on the cross and I'm going to ask you to come and be the Lord of my life. A confession of Jesus of Lord. If you notice the ABCs, you admit to God that you're a sinner. You believe in what Jesus did and is working on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection. Then you see your confession of him as the Lord of your life. And it's as easy as that. And that once we do that, we have been changed. And there's a big word for that called reconciliation. So Jesus reconciled men to God and invited them to join him in the work. We have been commissioned, just like Jesus, to pursue people with a purpose, challenge people's faith, and then let God change them. Change them so that they can follow him and make other people disciples as well. Is that your life? Do you have a list of people that you're impacting? And one of the things that really has challenged me was actually watching uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Y'all seen that movie? It was just an excerpt of his life. I won't give you anything, so spoil. Everybody's turning off Facebook right now. Don't tell me. No. One of the things that has challenged me is every day, Mr. Rogers had a list of people that he would pray for. People that he had met. He would write their names down and take a picture of them so that he would remember who they were so that he could pray for them. He figured that God had brought them into his life so that he could have an impact on them. So he needed to make sure that he did so. Why did he think that way? Because he had been changed, just like you and I have when we met Jesus. And it wasn't anything special that we had done. It was something special that God had done. And it wasn't just for you, and it wasn't just for me. It was for anyone. But they just needed to know. And we were the only ones that could tell them. You've probably had some people going through your mind. You may be the only believer that they meet. I had an atheist friend in college. As far as I know, I'm the only person that ever really presented to him the gospel. And I'm glad that I did. Who have you shared Jesus' love with? Let's pray together.